All right, so there's a couple of things you just have to know about functions. So for instance, take this as an example. So this is going to be your function notation, which we say is f of x, and this is going to be the rule, which in this case just looks like an expression. We can always write functions like in terms of x's and y's, and a lot of times we write this in the same respect. We could say y equals a 2x squared minus 3. And the reason why we did that is we wanted to graph something on the Cartesian coordinate plane, right? So we'd have the x-axis, right, and the y-axis. Again, you can simply just think about a function in terms of like an x's and y's and just replace the y with the f of x because they both do represent the same thing in this expression, but there's something a little bit more that we get deeper down with f of x, right? So when we look at the equation, two equals two x squared minus three, that is a relationship between the x and the y variable. When we look into f of x, it just kind of gets in a little bit deeper. So we have the f, which basically that just kind of represents the name. Because what you'll notice when we're dealing with functions, we'll have f of x, we'll have h of x, and everything else. The x, in this case, what we call is what represents is our input variable. So we don't always have to use x, right? You could use f of t, f of h. I think that's going to be the most important thing to kind of differentiate when we're thinking about functions compared to an equation. Because for something to be a function, for every input, you can only have one unique output. Where that's not the case for an equation, because an equation is just dealing with a relationship between two variables. Okay, and then again, this one I already mentioned here is just going to be the rule, right? And that's basically what you're going to be able to follow. If you remember, we can look at the graphical approach and looking at the vertical line test. We can also just go and test the values. Like we're, whenever we plug something into the function, we should only get one unique output. So the cool thing about function notation is when we have this input value, I can basically replace this with anything. So like, what is the value of the function for like, um, let's say f of four? Well, again, if you notice here in this function notation, I'm just going to simply replace x with a four. And therefore in my rule, I'm going to replace x with a four. So therefore, now, whenever I do that, I always like to put parentheses uh, minus there because then again, that just reminds me that I replaced my x with a four. And now I can simply just simplify using my order of operations. So therefore, I have a four squared, which is going to be a 16. So two times a 16 minus three, two times 16 is going to be a 32 minus three and 32 minus three is going to be a 28. So therefore, what the value of this function is at four is going to equal 28. But remember that relationship with your x and your y relationship, even though we get deep down with this function notation, we still have this relationship between the X and the Y values where the Y represents the output value and the X represents the input value. So again, if I wanted to plot this point, and again, like I'm just gonna, you know, roughly some rough sketching or some rough scaling here. And but let's just say here on the Y coordinate here, that's a 28 and the X coordinate that's four. So therefore we can see we have this coordinate point of four comma 28. And again, the main idea with this function is whenever I plug in four, I should only get 28, right? I cannot get any other answer. And if I did, then I would not be dealing with a function. Now it's important, we can actually plug anything into a function. It doesn't just have to be a number. Like for instance, even on a function, if I had, you know, let's just use the same function. So if I said f of x equals a 2x squared minus three, and I said, well, why don't you go ahead and find a f of a three minus x? Like what exactly would that value be? Well, again, like looking back at what we just did, whenever we had a four inside this function notation, that's why I replaced with my input value. Well, I would just do the same thing here. So this would be a two times a three minus x quantity squared minus three. Now I simply just need to go ahead and multiply this out, right? Now again, notice that three minus x squared, that's gonna be a three minus x times a three minus x. So therefore you're gonna wanna just make sure you expand that either by FOIL or by using the box method. So let's just go ahead and rewrite that out. Now again, if I wanted to multiply that, I'm gonna do this to the side. So I'll have a three minus x times a three minus x. And just make sure you multiply everything times everything. So you can use FOIL if you want to. Three times three is going to be a nine. Three times negative x is going to be negative three x. Negative x times three is a negative three x. And negative x times negative x is a positive x squared. And obviously I know you guys can simplify that quicker if you wanted to. And then we have a minus three here. Now I can combine my like terms. So a two times, let's see, nine minus a six x plus x squared minus three. And now we're going to distribute everything. And then I'm also going to kind of relabel them in descending order. So I have a two times x squared. So that's a two x squared minus a 12 x. And then two times nine is going to be a positive 18 minus three. And then let's simplify that one last time just doing everything step by step. We gotta love that, right? And now you can see here, that is going to be the, my new value. So F of three minus X. So when my input value is three minus X, that is going to be my new equation. But the cool thing about functions is that's a relationship, right? Input, output, input, output, output, input. Another question that we could ask is what is the value of X when F of X is equal to 47? 
Okay, so in this example, again, we have our same function. So f of x is equal to a 2x squared minus 3, right? But now we know what f of x is equal to. f of x is equal to 47. So we don't know what x is equal to, and that's what we actually want to find. So we have a 47 is equal to a 2x squared minus 3. Now what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to find the input value. And this is what I want you to understand. There's a difference here. We have input and output, input and output. So remember the input, when we wanted to find the output, we replaced a value in for the output, right? We, you know, it could be an expression or it could be a number. Now we want to find out what this input value is going to be. So now I'm just going to use my inverse operations to go ahead and solve. So I have a add three, both sides, and that's a 50 equals a 2x squared, divide by 2, divide by 2, 25 is equal to an x squared, and then you can take the square root of both sides. Now, again, remember whenever you introduce the square root, you're going to have a plus or minus a five equals an x. Now, I might say, hey, there's two answers, right? And when you talked about you can't have two answers. Yes, but remember, this represents the input. As long as our input produces a unique output, we have a function. But now what I'm looking at, I can have two different inputs provide the same output. And that's exactly what is happening in this case, which is perfectly fine. Now, I've been talking a lot about inputs and outputs for a very important reason. Because remember, when we're dealing with functions, not only do you need to understand what function notation is and how we use it, but you also need to understand the domain and the range of functions. That's something I want to further explore in these next set of videos. Right now, I just want to do a quick little review of understanding the domain and range and how do we find it for a particular function. So again, remember our function f of x equals a 2x squared minus 3. Now, what if I needed to find the domain and the range of this function? Well, the easiest way I think to understand the domain and range is because remember the domain is the set of all numbers that you can plug in, right? All the inputs. So we think about that and we say, well, what are all the numbers that I can plug in for X. And then you start thinking, you're like, well, I can do negative two, negative five. I can do seven. I could do one eighth. I could do two fifths. I could do square root of seven. There's infinite many numbers I can plug in because like, is there any number I can't plug in? To the top of my head, to my knowledge, I, I'm not seeing anything. And then we look at the output. Now the output might be a little bit different. If I can plug in anything in for the input, what are all the options for my output? And you might be thinking, well, that's going to be infinite many numbers as well, like all real numbers as we talk about in our real number system. But that's actually not the case. So I think it's really important when we're first thinking about domain and range to look at this graphical approach. Maybe you know what this graph looks like, maybe you don't, but I'm just going to go ahead and assume that we have a general understanding of graph and quadratics and go ahead and graph this for you. You can see what I have to deal with, but hopefully you at least get the main idea of what I have, right? Anyways, what I want you to see is this what the graph looks like. Now let's go ahead and again, think about like our input. Remember X, here's the X axis, right? Well, remember X represents our input. That is our input values. That is going to be the set of the domain. So when we're thinking about the domain, we're thinking about what are all the numbers that we can plug into this function. And if you kind of look at the end behavior of this graph, as this graph keeps on going up and up and up, it's going to keep on expanding, right? It's going to keep on going left and left and left and right and right and right. Therefore, it makes sense that there is all real numbers that we can plug into this function. There's no restrictions on a number that we cannot plug in, at least a real number that we cannot plug in to this function. And again, interval notation is basically saying like all real numbers going to negative infinity as well as going to positive infinity and everything in between is going to be a part of our domain. Now, when we're looking at the range, we have something different. Remember the range is the set of output values, right? That's going to be your Y, or we could call this the F of X axis. Remember they're kind of interchangeable. So we know as we're going up, that graph is never going to stop, right? That's going to keep on going up to infinity. However, when no matter what numbers we plug in, right? We have infinite many numbers, infinite many real numbers, all real numbers that we can plug in for X. Our Y value is only going to go down to negative three. It never gets below that. So my range is actually restricted to how low it's going to go. And that restriction is going to be all the way down to negative three. So the range in this case is going to be from all real numbers that are being going to be greater than or equal to negative three. To write that in interval notation, we'll actually use a bracket, which is going to say we're including negative three all the way up to infinity. Now, this function was rather simple to be able to identify the domain range because it was easy to graph and it was easy to visualize. But what about when we have some functions that are not easily to graph or not easy to visualize, or maybe have some restrictions on their domain? What are restrictions on the domain and how do we find the domain and range from there? Well, in the next video, that's exactly what I'll explore. So go ahead and check out that video if you're interested, or if you want more examples on how to find the domain and range of a function, go ahead and check out the examples I have below. Cheers.